Hi, I'm Jeff Hawthorne, a former atheist and now Bible defender. I believe that God is real and so are Satan and demons. Actually, I saw a demon once and I wasn't the only person present who did. I was given the opportunity to deliver consecutive messages at my church. The first message was the story of how God walked with me over several decades. Through that journey, he guided me into understanding what I explained in the second sermon, two scripture weapons. We can use the two weapons to stand shoulder to shoulder with other believers and do battle against Satan's demons. Now, the first of those two weapons is understanding one of Satan's strategies. You will learn how he takes something that's true, turns it around completely backwards, and then traps us into thinking that his reverse teaching is correct. The other weapon is a principle that God has placed in the Bible which enables us to establish what he actually does say on the subject. Both weapons are very simple in concept, and I hope that you find that they argue to flush out reverse teachings and reject them, and also to clearly establish what our precious Saviour really does say on very important subjects. Well, this has been a long time coming for me, <laughs> and I just hope this is a real blessing to you. I'm so thrilled with the, the support that uh, I was shown as a response to the testimony that I gave last week that, um, that introduced this whole calling that um, I just hope really ministers to, to all of you. Um, before I go any further, if uh, I, I have a little website. I read an editorial a long time ago where a seminary professor said, if God is God, he's not afraid of questions. <laughs> and I like finding answers to questions to, to defend the Bible. And so I started a little website called ifgodisgod.com. And if you want to email me through that website, uh, it's Jeff, G-E-O-F-F. -F. It's like Jeff is in Jeffrey, it's just the weird British spelling and I'm not even British, um, jeff at ifgodisgod.com. So you, know, you always contact me there if you would like to for any reason. Uh, anyway, these two tools, uh, they're two tools that we can use to work together as fellow believers. There are thousands of different Christian denominations in America alone, all with a different interpretation of one book. And we need a way of not doing battle with each other, but realising how the enemy goes about what he does to deceive and confuse and to try to get the attention in place of God, which is all he ever wanted, and also how God establishes what he says. So these two things are going to reveal to you are tools that we can use to work together in our marriages, in our communities, in our churches or whatever. If you uh, happen to have two different religious backgrounds in a marriage, then this might be just what you need. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, but they are definitely weapons that we can use to form a common front against a common enemy instead of doing battle with each other so much. Because when the Lord returns, he is going to return for a bride who worships him in spirit and in truth. And we don't seem to have a problem with the spirit part. But the truth part is very, very difficult. Uh, and these tools, even though they can deal with extremely complex subjects like Bible prophecy are actually very simple in their concept and you don't need to understand all of the complexities to apply them and get this, the basics that God is, is saying so that you can build on it. So, now, the slides that I have today, I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, the slides will be colour-coded just to make it a little easier to realise which part of this battle the various texts are applying to. Most of the text will just be in white. But some of that, if I want you to take special notice, will be in gold. If it fits the strategy of Satan, it'll be in red. And if it doesn't fit the strategy of Satan, it'll be in green. So white, gold, red, green. All right, let's get right into it. Satan's simple strategy. Now, as some of you would have known from last week, I, got a, um, uh, I went to college when I got to America and I learned about a logical fallacy, among many other things, 
called Hypothesis Contrary to Fact, which basically says, as you can see, you start with a hypothesis that's not true, you can't build any supportable conclusions on it. In other words, if you start with something that's not true and go therefore, 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 what you end up with is going to end up false, even if it seems to make sense within itself. It's got to be false. Same thing applies to a belief, not just a scientific hypothesis. But I learned from a from an Answers in Genesis creation seminar I went to, that that also is in the Bible. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I found out, the more I thought about it, when God called me to start a class, and he was making me aware of this because of so many things he'd led me through leading up to that, that Satan doesn't only destroy God's foundation, he replaces it with his own. He turns it around completely backwards so that will build on something that's backwards and end up with the opposite to what God says. Now you'd think, well, how do we fall for that? I had fallen for it with the theory of evolution because the foundation of that is the earth being hundreds of millions of years old and just happening by accident. And I realised that I had been told that it was scientifically proven. Get into that more in a minute, but I didn't know enough about it to realise that it wasn't. So I call that second part the dazzle factor, just a catchy thing that I came up with. I hope you like it. But anyway, I, I realised the more I thought about it that there are actually two further parts to the dazzle factor. The part that we know is true, the tangible part, and then the second part, which is very dangerous, what we have to take by faith and are trapped into thinking is true. So I'll give you a few examples of that in a moment. But that second part is the most dangerous element because that's what makes us believe that this backward starting point is truth and we build our belief on that. So it's really, oddly enough, the strategy of Satan, I mean, he's probably got dozens of strategies and you would think they would all be so complicated, me and mortals would never figure them out. But this is so simple and he does it again and again and again. It's right there in plain sight. So, oh, and by the way, I need to um, point out, when he has pulled this second part off, we get trapped in the lies via sadistic emotional blackmail. So it's not up for discussion. Uh, when that's happened, we have to think the unthinkable just to begin to escape. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that, particularly in the area of Bible prophecy, when I'm finished on that subject. But uh, any confusion is a warning sign that he has pulled this off. But I've noticed these three pop up very frequently. Contradictions that you can't resolve, critical factors that you just have to leave out because if you include them, it blows your belief to bits. But they are nevertheless valid things in the Bible that should be included. And you often end up going around in circles trying to make sense out of it. So let's have a few quick examples. Now, each one of these could have a sermon within itself. So all I can do is brush over them very, very quickly. But I need you to see how consistent this is so that when I get into Bible prophecy and explain the second weapon, then you can see this happening as I you know, unmask one of the accomplishments of the enemy who seeks to divide and destroy us all. Reversing the foundation. God said, I am God. If you eat the fruit, you'll die. <laughs> That's what Eve was supposed to make her decision based on and not eat the fruit. But along came Satan. You won't die, eat the fruit. You'll be like God. So already, what God said has been turned around completely backwards, 180 degrees, and that's what Eve made her decision on. But all she had to do was not eat the fruit from one tree. A very simple instruction, but Satan still managed to get her to do it. And these were unfallen human beings. So the dazzle factor, the tangible part, the fruit looked good and the serpent could talk... <laughs> implication there is, hey, I ate the fruit, and look at me, you know, I've got special powers. You eat the fruit, you know, you'll get all this knowledge that God doesn't want you to have. But the part she had to take by faith as that special ability came from eating the fruit. Turned out that snake was a puppet for a demon, and confusion came into the world, sin and death. So, next, origins. The theory of evolution versus creation. Reverse the foundation. Recently, God created everything on purpose. That's what the Bible says, and science does support that. Uh, I was an atheist, for those of you who don't know, largely because of the theory of evolution, and I've since learned it's a failed theory, and Darwin would be trying to convince us of that if he were alive today. Uh, the reverse of that, over millions of years, everything happened by accident. 
You start building on that and you'll end up with something backwards. The tangible part is we're told that it's scientifically proven, uh, which is, you know, solid science. Science is wonderful when it's done right. part we have to take by faith is that the old earth is good science. Turns out it's not. The remains of the animals and plants in the earth's layers and everything is completely consistent with a global flood and a young earth. Confusion, it conflicts with science and it gave us a backwards culture because we built on a backwards foundation for all these years. So, next. Now, this applies to um, the wages of sin, Bible prophecy, as I'll explain, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, these are the real biggies, the real core subjects for us to understand, to really be in an intimate relationship with the Lord. Um, I can't explain all of that now, but there is a, an experience that many Christians have called speaking in tongues. Now, the, the Bible, I'm 100% sure, <laughs> never describes anything called a heavenly prayer language. But millions of Christians think that if they have this experience, uh, this ecstatic utterance, they're speaking in a heavenly prayer language, praying to God. Now... What the Bible's actually talking about is this is the gift of languages. A tongue in the Bible is a language. The gospel's to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue, language and people. But um, the languages were confused, so God gave some believers the ability to speak whatever language they needed to speak to fulfill the Great Commission because that gift was told, Jesus said, they will speak in other languages. That was one of the signs. And it was given in association with the Great Commission. Now, um, once people have had this experience, there's an emotional blackmail that if they try to back out of it because there seems to be confusion in it, they may find themselves trapped in this. If you speak in tongues, that's proof that you're baptised in the Spirit and are therefore saved. If you stop speaking in tongues, then you've quenched the Holy Spirit, and if you quench the Holy Spirit, you will lose your salvation. So it's not up for discussion. It's a trap. And you can't back out of it because it has become a salvation issue. Now, as I said, there's no such thing as a heavenly prayer language, but as long as you think it is, and that's proof that you're saved, you're never going to want to give it up. Now, that same emotional blackmail is going to show up again at the end of the sermon when we talk about Bible prophecy. Okay, so now Daniel 7, now I'm not going to get deeply into all the Bible prophecies today as I said earlier, the simplicity of this is what's so wonderful about it. You don't need to do that to establish what God has said. But our church believes what the Protestant reformers believed about uh, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, as you remember, most of you would know there are four beasts. There's a lion, uh, a bear, a leopard and then a nondescript beast and there's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And out of that nondescript fierce beast, the fourth one, come some horns. And that's really the part that we need to focus on today. It says that there are ten horns, seven are pulled up by the roots by an eleventh horn that comes up amongst them. Now, we're not going to get too much deeper into this prophecy than that. Uh, there's so much deep stuff in there. But the Protestant reformers protested against the church government of the day because they, among other things, realised that the power that rose up when the Roman Empire fell was bas basically, it was papal Rome. This is amazing, this prophecy. It's so extraordinarily accurate. And a thousand years after it was written, it talks about how pagan Rome turned into papal Rome. Now, this happened many, many centuries ago, and none of us had anything to do with any of the decisions that any of these people made. Okay, so I'm not blaming anybody, I'm not slam-dunking anybody today, this is something we have a common enemy and it isn't each other. And we need to realise, you know, what happened in history and where are we now and how can we know that for sure so that we can form a united front. But that little horn, the Protestant reformers believed was Papal Rome and we still believe the same thing in our church. Um, there were ten kingdoms when Rome fell and... Three of them would not go along with this new power that was coming up, so they went to war and they were destroyed. Now, that's actually what the prophecy said. Um, it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and 
Behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man. And then there was the interpretation, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Another shall arise after them and shall be diverse from the others and shall subdue three kings. This was written a thousand years before this happened and it was fulfilled with flawless accuracy. If nothing else, that is another proof that God really does exist, that we're not alone in the universe and that he loves us enough to tell us ahead of time what's going to happen. Now, there are nine identifying marks of this power and I'm not going to go into them, but suffice to say that history teaches us that papal Rome is the only power in history that has fulfilled all nine. So I'm absolutely convinced that that is the fulfilment of this prophecy. Um, I have members of my family that are members of this church and I love them dearly. And most Protestants don't even understand all of this, much less those folks. So this is just to explain, uh, to help us to understand how the enemy works and what he's accomplished. But um, I talked about the kingdoms. Uh, he'll be given into his hand for time, times, and the dividing of time. Many would know that works out at 1260 years, and that's how long that power ruled. Think to change times and laws did that as well. That's how the Sabbath was changed from, from Saturday to Sunday. But anyway, as I said, only Pope, Papal Rome has fulfilled all of these. That's why people were protesting, and that's how they got the name Protestants. <laughs> Now we say Protestants. Okay, now, when I get into Bible prophecy, the question we're going to have to look at is, is there a gap? Because the prophecies I just explained, very briefly, most Christians today, and most of the movies about Bible prophecy and the return of Christ today teach, that that prophecy is going to be fulfilled in our future, during a seven-year period that is yet to be fulfilled. Now, there is nothing mentioned in that prophecy about a gap, but that gap comes from another prophecy in the book of Daniel. That's what we'll be talking about when we get into Bible prophecy. But let's just touch on it a bit now. At issue, two takes on a timeline. Now, here's the prophecy, and we're not going to get into all of the, the nuts and bolts of it at all. There are just a few things here that I've highlighted in yellow. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Many would understand 70 weeks is 490 days and that translates into 490 years. And down here, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem till the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, so that's 69 weeks. And then in the, uh, after the 69 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. So those three things. It's 490 years there's 483 years and then seven more years. That's really about as much as you need to understand about what we're trying to discover today. You don't need to dig deeply into all of these prophecies. But the thing is, um, the Protestant reformers believed that 490 years was all fulfilled in the past and the movies that we make today say that 483 years was fulfilled in the past and there's still seven years to go in the future. That's what we're going to examine and uh, we'll go through several pairs in the Bible to establish what the Bible does and does not say. So, and, and there it is, 490 years versus 483 years. The theological terms, just so you know, is the historicist view and the futurist view. Futurist view, it's seven years yet to be fulfilled. They were the Protestant reformers and some Jesuit scholars raised up by Papal Rome were commissioned with the task to come up with these alternates to Bible prophecy teaching because it was such a problem for papal Rome many, many centuries ago. So, anyway, we have uh, a graphic here, as you see, 483 years and then seven years and they're back to back and this particular take on it, very important, is fulfilled at the baptism of Jesus. Now, you don't need to know all of the dates and everything like that. Notice I haven't highlighted any of those. We can get so caught up in all of that. But they're the only three things that you really need to know about this 490-year prophecy, that there's 483 years and then seven years immediately after and one change to the other when Jesus got baptised. Now, this is another one. I got these two graphics off the internet and I just put some highlights on them. This one has 483 years. It started at a different time, but that doesn't matter today. 483 years, and then when Jesus was crucified, that time stopped, and then all of that time up until now called the church age, and then there's seven years in the future. So hopefully that makes it clear what we're studying today. Now, we will find confusion, as I, as I said, if there are warning signs that this is 
something that the enemy has tampered with. Uh, this is the prophecy that all the movies and everything are all about in the New Testament. And I'll just read the first part, and you'll all be pretty familiar with this, most of you, but just to put it out there. And it's a wonderful, wonderful verse. It's, what, it's the blessed hope. It's what we're all just so excited about, that this is actually going to happen to us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now I'll put that slide up again later with something down here um, that's, um, that'll be highlighted as well because that's one of the pairs we need to look at later on. But this is the New Testament prophecy. Now, way back in the late 60s, early 70s, the Christian church made a movie called Thief in the Night. That term, Thief in the Night, actually comes from the Bible and it talks about, um, it's believed to talk about the disappearing of the Christians when Christ returns. That the Christians just vanish into thin air and then that seven years commences. Now, people have different views as to exactly when it happens in relation to seven years, but the movies say... The rapture happens and then seven years begins. And this movie depicted that. So there's no way of, of wriggling out of the fact that Christian thinking in the big picture takes that phrase from the Bible and believes it to mean the disappearing of the Christians and then life goes on. Now, this song was the theme song from that movie or a little bit of the words. And... The songwriter that wrote it wrote some wonderful songs and I've really enjoyed them over the years. But this one called I Wish We'd All Been Ready. Um, my man and wife are asleep in bed. She hears a noise and her, turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears. One's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. So... This is clearly describing the disappearing of the Christians, right? And notice the left behind that I highlighted there because this was the precursor of our left behind movies that we have now. Now, this is another song by the exact same songwriter. And uh, he used the comparison of an identified flying object to see Jesus coming to get us home. It's describing the same event, Jesus coming to resurrect the dead and take us all home. But notice this. He's an unidentified flying object. You will see him in the air. Now, the other song, the Christian just vanished and nobody saw him. But in this song, everybody sees him. He's an identified flying object. You will drop your hands and stare. You'll be afraid to tell your neighbours. They might think that it's not true. But when you open up the morning papers, you will know they've seen it too. So life goes on. People who weren't caught up to be with Jesus are still alive. And everybody saw him return. He'll come back as he promised with the price already paid. He will gather up his followers and take them all away. This is definitely talking about the rapture. But the other verse, the other song, said the polar opposite. Two very popular songs by a wonderful Christian songwriter. And I didn't even notice the contradictions. I mean, I used to enjoy them. So what was it that had me so into the whole belief that I didn't even notice that? Here's another modern song just from a few years ago that says the same thing. One day I'll see you coming back for me and all together we'll fly away. One day I'll hear that trumpet loud and clear and all together we'll fly away. So here we're singing songs that say everybody will see him and everybody will hear him but the movies, nobody sees him and nobody hears him. So we've got a contradiction here, haven't we? big contradiction that you can't have it both ways people try to explain it by saying well there's a visible coming at the end of the seven years but that's not what people are singing about people are singing about when he comes to gather us and take us home and that passage i read about when the resurrection happens and so on says that you know there will be a trumpet blast and the shout of an archangel but that seems to be a critical factor that's getting left out of the movies but included in the songs so we have contradictions here. And also, as you'll see, another thing that's left out is Jesus talked very, very repeatedly that when he comes, he'll gather his people and it'll be the end of the world. Okay, here goes. Pairs in prophecy. Now, 
uh, those of you who weren't here last week, uh, you wouldn't know, but um, uh, well, just a reminder, Jeff at ifgodisgod.com. I wanted to tell you that again just to make sure. Uh, I received these verses and answered prayer after things happening in my life for twice for 38 years. Uh, if you want to know more about that, watch the video that is eventually going to be on our website because it was the strangest thing. So many things would happen in pairs, things that I just only I would notice. But after many years, I asked God to show me, why are you doing this? I thought it was just him showing me that he's around. And then I started to realize there are a lot of pairs in the Bible, especially on the subject of prophecy. And then I asked him, okay, I can show people these pairs, but they might say, well, so what? It's there twice, big deal. So is there a principle that you've put in the Bible that says this is how you do things sometimes? And to my astonishment, there was. <laughs> The way he answered his prayer is a whole other miracle. He actually brought me to a place of astonishment twice. Typical. Um, but this is the principle in Genesis 41, verse 32. It's when Joseph was explaining the two visions about Egypt and the famine that was coming. And there was the fatted calves and the skinny calves and the ripe corn and the withered corn. And after he'd explained all of that, he said, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice... It's because the thing is established by God. And I'm getting a little lump in my throat just remembering the moment that happened because it's new to most of you, but it was 38 years of pairs for me. And when that happened, it was, oh boy, it had this planned all along with everything that I was going through. So there are four issues that we're going to try to resolve with this question of whether or not that seven years was fulfilled in the past or whether or not it's in the future. Because that prophecy, as many of you will know, was a probationary period for Israel. And if there's seven years still to go in the future, then it's understandable how our brothers and sisters in Christ that might not be completely in agreement with what we believe about this prophecy as a church, why they might be so passionate and so supportive of Israel. And, uh, and I'm not going to slam dunk Israel either. I've got Israel is completely innocent in what we're talking about today and I've got several very prominent Jewish men on my prayer list and I'll show you about a website later for Jewish people that have come to Christ and it's, it's awesome. So, um, but anyway, we'll get to all of that. But these are the four questions we're going to look at and we'll find this very, 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 very simple tool that we can use together but weapon that we can use against the enemy to establish what God actually does say. Was that 69th week, 483 years, fulfilled at Jesus' baptism or at around the time of his crucifixion? That's the first question. Simple enough. So either 490 years all happened back then or 483 years and then the other seven. That's the second question. Was it uninterrupted or cut into two parts? Thirdly, will the world end when Christ returns or will life go on? And finally, and this is where I expect the rapture to happen here, all right, when we go... Is the seed of Abraham the Christians or the Jews? I expect you all to go and just take off up the road because this is a volatile question. <laughs> a lot of people don't even want to you know, hear and talk about that. They've already made up their minds. But trust me, it won't be bad. And it's not what you expect. It's actually uh, quite different. So question one, was that 69th week, 483rd year in that 490-year prophecy fulfilled at Jesus' baptism? or around the time of his crucifixion. Okay, let's get into it. Now, the first pair that I noticed uh, after, <clears throat> after I'd asked God to show me is there more to this, I remembered I had read this. In the entire Old Testament, <clears throat> which is all about the Messiah, there are 48 prophecies just about his first coming. The word Messiah only shows up two times in the entire Old Testament, which is pretty astonishing when you think about it. But not only that, it, it appears in this prophecy that we're talking about. It's not like one's in the book of Genesis, Genesis and the, ones in, the other one's at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, they're both in this same passage of Scripture. So, the word Messiah occurred twice. So, all right then, so, terrific. But then, it came to my attention as well, through reading a little more, that it's mentioned twice in the Gospels. So, here's our second pair. We've already got two pairs. The first one is in John 1.41. Uh, he first looked for and found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. Now, why did they 
How do they know he was even supposed to show up then? And where did they get that word? <laughs> There's only one place in their Bible, the Old Testament, that they could even know that, and that was that prophecy I had on the screen a second ago. So that's the first time they refer to it. And I love this next one in the Living Bible. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and eager to know whether or not John was he. This was the question of the hour and was being discussed everywhere. So there's the setting. Okay, Jesus Christ is about to be baptised. And Israel knows the Messiah is supposed to come. And they know because of this time prophecy, and that's where they got the word Messiah from. That's the third pair here. We know there are two reasons why we know that Israel was referring to that prophecy. It's the only time prophecy that said when the Messiah would appear, and it's the only place in the Old Testament where that word even shows up. So we already have three pairs about this one subject. Okay? And Jesus went all over the region after he got baptised and said... The time is fulfilled. What time? He was telling Israel, I'm the Messiah, that prophecy has been fulfilled. So Jesus established here, the 483 years was up at his baptism, not at his crucifixion. And it's that easy to get to the bottom of this. Three pairs. Yeah. There they are. Messiah occurs twice in the Old Testament. Israel refers to the 70 weeks prophecy twice and there are two reasons why we know that's what they're referring to. So if you just find these pairs and get those tiny little truths from them and put them together, you can resolve a problem and you don't have to dig into all the heavy-duty Bible prophecy. So this is what Jesus said was true in terms of when that 483 years ended, that historicist view. Um, and so we already look like we're getting a reverse foundation because this one says that that was fulfilled when he was crucified. And Jesus said no. So we've answered the first question already. <clears throat> the green part, 69th week, was fulfilled at the baptism. The red part, crucifixion, no. Question two, was the 70 weeks one uninterrupted period of time or is it cut into 69 and then one in our future? Simple question. Let's look for some pairs, see what we find. Now, to do that, we're going to have to look a little bit at another chapter in Daniel, chapter 8, but we're not going to get into it really deeply. Most of you would be pretty familiar with this. You know, most Christians are. Uh, there's, in Daniel 2, there's the metal man. And in Daniel 7, there's the four beasts that symbolize Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Europe. Um, but then that nondescript beast I talked about, and the Europe, we get a lot more details about all of them, but Europe gives us how pagan Rome turned into papal Rome. Then in chapter 8, it doesn't talk about Rome, but it gives us a ram, which we are told, we're given the interpretation, that that's Medo-Persia, and then the goat is Greece, the goat's horn broke off, and four came up in its head, that was Alexander the Great dying, and his four generals went to war to get control of the kingdom, and then out of one of those kingdoms, it said that a little horn, that another horn will come up and become really great and it'll be powerful and blasphemous and rule the whole earth. And that's where we're going to step into this prophecy. Okay, so up came another little horn and there's just this question. And this is really as much as we need to know about it. How long will it take for that vision to be fulfilled? Uh, and the answer was it'll take 2,300 evenings and mornings. So this blasphemous power was going to rule for that long. So that's going to give us our first clue, our first pair. I found this one in one of our Bible studies. That the first pair is that there are two words in the Hebrew language that both translate into the English word vision. So we would miss that if we were just reading through it in English. But when you realise that there are two different Hebrew words, they're referring to two different things. And now we can narrow down what's actually going on here. One is chazon. I don't know how to say it in I barely say it in English, let alone Hebrew. So, chazon, which means the entire vision. And then mare is the Hebrew word that just means just that time prophecy part of it. So, and this is where we see them used. And again, I've just highlighted the parts in gold. Uh, these two Hebrew words, the vision, mare, of the evenings and mornings. Okay, the time prophecy. was told you is correct. This is at the end of chapter 8. Uh, but you should seal up the vision Chazon, the, the bigger vision, uh, 
which has already been interpreted. We, we were told the ram is Medo-Persia, the goat is Greece. We've got an interpretation for that. For it refers to a time many days from now, which it did, it's been fulfilled since, but this was like two and a half thousand years ago. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. I got up and I carried out the king's business, but I was astonished at the vision mare, because there was no one to explain it. This had not been interpreted yet. Now, this is giving us a tremendous clue in resolving this. Here's what we're left with at this stage. The metal man in chapter 2, vision and interpretation. The four beasts in Daniel in 7, vision and interpretation. Chapter 8, the chazone, the ram and the goat, uh, and the little horn, vision and interpretation. But the 2,300 days, the mare vision, vision, no interpretation yet. So this is all pretty easy enough to follow, I think, isn't it, if you're kind of familiar with these Bible prophecies? So then we go over to chapter 9, and we're back where we were before, to the 70 weeks prophecy, that 490 years. Gabriel shows up, and he says, therefore, because he's explaining to Daniel, Daniel had prayed for understanding. It's been one of those days. Okay. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision, Mare. Thank you, sir. Therefore, consider the vision, Mare. So now he's going to explain the Mare vision, the time prophecy, and he says, 70 weeks have been determined upon your people Israel. So, very simple. Now, it's not going to pick this thing up. We have an interpretation now, but we needed to know that there was a pair. There was a, two Hebrew words that both meant vision in English, so we would miss that. And it just helps to know those two words because now we know that that 70 weeks that we're discussing is explaining this time prophecy in the previous chapter. So, second pair. Two reasons that we know that Gabriel is explaining that vision. Firstly, it's the only vision that he hasn't explained yet. <laughs> and secondly, he says so. He says, I'm here to explain that vision that you wanted to understand the Mare vision. And now, already, we're at the third pair. Now, I know you can't read this, so I've zoomed in on it on the next screen, but there are two reasons we know that that 490 years are a part of this longer-time prophecy and therefore not separate, that we can separate into two parts. Uh, this word down here, 70 weeks have been determined. Over there, I won't even try to say the Hebrew word, but that little red box over there, here's the zoom in. 70 weeks have been determined. That means to cut off. So that means this 490 years is cut off that longer time prophecy, uninterrupted. So all we had to do was find three pairs on each of those questions and now we have established, I think, in a way that is airtight and watertight, that that 490 years was all fulfilled back here and it is not going, seven years cannot be separated from it and fulfilled in the future. But that's what the Christian church is spending millions of dollars making movies about. Telling people, if you miss the rapture, you can accept the Lord during the seven-year tribulation. Big problem. But there's these light blue parts of what I had before, but see the green parts here. 2,300 years, 490 years is a part of that. Now, worth noting as well, these parts over here, the um, 1260 years I talked about, this is going to pop up at the end of the sermon as well. Don't have to worry about the dates, but this power that fulfilled that little horn prophecy, was, um, that was a part of, of that fulfilment, is what's there in blue, that the, this Antichrist power has come and gone, and as we would all know, is rising back to power as we speak. So, these are our three pairs. Um, whether or not it's uninterrupted or separated. Sorry, that's the third pair. Two reasons. It's established that he was explaining the Mare vision in the previous pair and that determined means cut off. So we've got these three pairs now. Two Hebrew words, two reasons we know Gabriel's explaining that vision and then from that, two reasons we know that it's one uninterrupted period of time. Now this answers the second question, was that 70 weeks uninterrupted or cut into 69 in the past but one in the future? It's all fine and dandy if you, know, you happen to be a member of a church that believes that. But if you're not, 
then we're starting to run into a big problem because now we've found that the foundation has been reversed like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. And suddenly things get really diabolical. This isn't just theology. 70 weeks has been fulfilled in the past by the Christ. That's the biblical foundation. The reverse foundation is that 70th week, that seven years will be fulfilled in the future by the Antichrist. They could not be more opposite. They're as opposite as evolution and creation. And if you build on something that's backwards, you're going to end with something that's backwards. So, so let's continue. Oh, by the way, with that seven years, and people believe that the prophetic clock for Israel stopped when Jesus was crucified. And so, so many prophecies in Revelation that talk about Israel all have to be jammed into that seven years. And this is what a lot of people believe is going to happen during that seven years. As you can see, it's all about uh, what's going to happen to Israel. Because if that seven years is in the future, it is all about Israel. So let me talk briefly about Israel if you are waiting for that seven-year tribulation being kicked off by the rapture, let me assure you, you can reject that reverse foundation and still love Israel. Nobody is advocating to reject Israel, but that is a trap that the enemy would really like us to be trapped in and be welded to this future prophecy that Jesus himself said is the polar opposite. There is an amazing website called imetmessiah.com which is video testimonies of Jewish people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Wonderful. Spend some time there. He loves these people so much. So question three. Will the world end when Jesus returns or will life go on? For now, this is where we start getting into... We were, Sabbath school today was just great. It was the perfect segue into this. Because the first pair is to talk about the days of Noah. There are three very popular expressions to do with you know, this, this teaching. As it was in the days of Noah, um, one will be taken and the other left, and the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So they're the three passages we're going to look at, and we're going to find there's a pair in each one of them that establishes what Jesus said. His disciples asked him two things. Tell us when shall this, these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? End of the world, I should say. Now, he answered it in two parts. First, he went through all the signs and he said, and then shall the end come. So he didn't say, when I return, the end of the world is not going to happen. It's going to be a seven-year tribulation and then a thousand-year millennial reign. He said, it will be the end of the world when he returns. But he wasn't even talking about the days of Noah in that. The days of Noah is given in the context of that, where he says the end of the world. But actually, the days of Noah, he was talking about the when, not the what. And it's amazing when we get preoccupied with one of these ideas and we think there's going to be a future, that we gloss over the rest of it. Jesus has already said it's going to be the end of the world, but we don't notice what he actually says. And he says of that... Uh, um, of that day and that hour knows no man. He's saying, this is the when part. I'm answering that now. As the days of Noah were, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away and so also the coming of the Son of Man will be. In other words, he was saying, you won't know when I'm coming until I'm here. Just like the people in Noah's day didn't know when the flood was going to hit until it hit them. You will not know when the flood is going, when, when I'm going to return until you see me in the sky. So don't date set. <laughs> the great disappointment was 172 years ago today. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. So still on the first pair, the days of Noah is referred to in another place, in Luke, as it was in the days of Noah. But as you can see very clearly... He says, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And in the days of Lot, with that, two examples worth noting, uh, he rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And even thus it shall be when the Son of Man is revealed. Again, Jesus comes, gets his people, puts them in a safe place, the rest are destroyed. So that's another pair that establishes that. Oh, sorry, so that's the first pair. Now another pair, one will be taken and the other left. That's the verse that was used in that, um, that song that I did before, One Disappears and One's Left Standing Still. It's a paraphrase of that. And, um, but it's very important as well to notice, 
Uh, they knew not until a flood came and took them all away. And then later on, one shall be taken, the other left. One shall be taken, the other left. The ones that are taken are not taken up. They're taken out. And how clear is that? Whoever shall seek to life seek to save his life shall lose it that's in the other one one shall be taken and the other left so there's two references to one taken and the other left there's a pair of those two two of the days of Noah two one taken the other left and this one's really very very telling the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night that was the bible verse that they used to name the movie so there's no escaping the fact that in Christian thinking that's what this meant at the time and the belief that it came from is still around so we're back now to this same verse that I put up before. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. But still talking about the same event, it says, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, and sudden destruction will come upon them. So it already talks about destruction, but people would think, well, planes, trains and automobiles crashing because the, the pilots are all disappearing, there'll be lots of destruction. But if there's a pair, don't leave either of them out. Dangerous thing to do. The other one is in 2 Peter chapter 3, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and look, listen to this, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and all the works that are in it shall be burned up. Now how is that, this? They could not be more different. Once again, if you start with something that's backwards, you'll end with something backwards, and we tend to miss that. If we already assume that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation in the future... So, third question, three pairs, days of Noah, one taken and the other left, and thief in the night, answered, resolved again, very simply, with the principle of pairs. Final question, is the seed of Abraham the Christians or the Jews? Now, firstly, let me touch on the purpose of this teaching that Papal Rome came up with was simply to shine the spotlight of Bible prophecy away from the present when it was being fulfilled by them actually came up with two teachings. One, preterism, that said they were all going to be fulfilled in the past, had been up until about 70 AD. And then this one, the futurism, that they're all going to be fulfilled off in the future and the prophetic clock has stopped. Therefore, those prophecies don't point at us now. That's what the papacy back then would have been saying. And, uh, and it was very effective. They uh, simply sent Jesuit scholars into Protestant churches, had them lie, say they were Protestants, and lead Bible studies, and here we are. So now let's look at the seed of Abraham and the Christians and the Jews. Now, very important to realise this. Now we're at the point where we've got to look at the dazzle factor. Why is it that people are so locked into this belief and will, would rather die than deny it? There's got to be something that has got people so passionately welded to it. You can reject that reverse foundation and still love Israel. Nobody is advocating anything to the contrary. But we need to talk about what is this covenant about? Because people think it's about current events, current politics, and it all revolves around the nation of Israel, ethnic Israel, people tend to think that it's about race and real estate. It's about ownership of the land and whether or not somebody is genetically a descendant of Abraham. I would like to suggest and show you a few pairs that prove this, that it isn't. It's about the Son of God and salvation for the whole world. So, here it comes. Is the seed of Abraham the Jews or the Christians? Dun, dun, dun. I'd like to suggest that it is neither. And I'll show you why. The first pair... Chapter 316 in John, we all know it so well. There are two chapter 3 verse 16s that are so critical to this. There's a pair of them. First one, salvation promised through one person. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. But then when you get to the other 316 in Galatians, this is where it gets to be kind of riveting, knowing how passionate people are about this seven-year future tribulation because of Israel. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. 
Now, the Apostle Paul knew more about God's covenant with Abraham and Jesus and the Jews and everything than all of us combined. And that's what he said about who the seed of Abraham is. The second pair is also in Galatians chapter 3. It's a wonderful chapter on this subject. I urge every Christian to read it 20 times in 30 different translations of the Bible. The second pair is that there are two statements in that chapter that say that to be a son of Abraham has nothing to do with blood. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are of sons of Abraham. And then the last, verse 7, then the last verse, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. So it has nothing to do with blood based on that. But the third pair really, really nailed it down for me when I learned that there were two pagan Gentile women in the bloodline of the Messiah. Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho uh, that helped the Israeli spies. She had turned out to be David's great-great-grandmother, King David's. And then Ruth, the Moabite woman, they descended from the incest between Lot and his oldest daughter. Now, this is hardly the pedigree of the Messiah, is it? If it's got anything to do with blood. But these amazing, wonderful, beautiful women both had a profession of faith and that's what made them sons and daughters of Abraham. That's what made them Jews. So, three pairs again. Two critical 3.16s, two texts in Galatians 3 that say that it's about faith, not blood, and then two Gentile women in the bloodline of the Messiah. So, final question answered. Is the seed of Abraham the Christians or the Jews? Neither. It's Jesus Christ. Now, this is the passage of Scripture that causes a lot of confusion I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Meaning ethnic Israel in the minds of most people, especially since this seven years is believed to be in the future. Well, he went on to say, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was referring to Jesus. That's how all the families of the earth have been blessed, is through the Son of God offering all of us salvation as a free gift. And Jesus repeated that, those same top two lines, when he gave the parable of the sheep and the goats that you'd all be familiar with. Truly I tell you, whatever you did or did not do for one of the least of these, you did or did not do for me. And it's not talking about blood Jews or anything. It's talking about anybody who is a stowaway in Jesus Christ, who has ceased to exist because Jesus replaces every nanosecond of our lives from conception to death. And we are already at the right hand of God because that's where he is. That's what makes anyone, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, slave or free, smart or dumb, rich or poor, doesn't matter. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. And that's what does it. So then what's the dazzle factor that keeps people so locked in? Remember, the second part of the dazzle factor is the most dangerous part because that's where we get trapped. And I'm going to show you that same emotional blackmail in just a second. Here's the dazzle factor. The enemy takes advantage of people's love for and loyalty to Israel. And it is not up for discussion. The tangible part is Israel still exists today. It's not like there's Sodom and Gomorrah or something that some people wonder whether they ever even existed. And there isn't a nation in the world that has a more amazing history than Israel. But the part we have to take by faith is that rejecting that future seven years is turning your back on Israel. And then it becomes a salvation issue. Here's that thing about speaking in tongues again, the spirit baptism counterfeit. If you speak in tongues... That's proof you're baptised in the Spirit and therefore saved. If you stop speaking in tongues, you've quenched the Spirit. And if you quench the Spirit, then you'll lose your salvation. Well, the same steps happen here. If you believe that seven-year prophecy is about Israel in the future, you therefore support Israel and you'll be blessed. If you don't believe that it's prophecy is about Israel, you therefore don't support Israel. And if you don't support Israel, you're turning your back on God. You see? Now... Most people who are waiting for a seven-year tribulation kicked off by the rapture never would have even thought of that. And I'm not saying that this is what everybody's got in their heads and so that's why they won't abandon this prophecy because of Israel. But if they ever try to back out of it because they start noticing the signs of confusion, that's what's waiting for them at the door, to try to push them back in because it becomes a salvation issue. So, and as a result, the final pair, we end up with two Israels. Ethnic Israel and in Christ Israel. Ethnic Israel is waiting for the Christ. 
But the Christ has come and gone and is coming again and not at all like what they're expecting. In Christ, Israel is waiting for the Antichrist. But the Antichrist has come and gone and is coming again and not at all like what they're expecting. So this is very compelling. These, um, these tools that we can use to work together, uh, th that's exactly what they need to be used as, not weapons against each other. These are ways that we can come together and fight a common enemy that is out to seek and destroy us. But if you see some of the things that you never did believe and you know, see that's exactly what the devil did in the Garden of Eden and they fit and they fit and they fit, that's all very well. But then all of a sudden you find, uh-oh, something you believed all your life that you've proclaimed, you've made enemies out of and it starts to have the same fingerprints of the devil all over it. That's when you're in a position where you have to think the unthinkable. But there is something worse than finding out. There may be a lot of things worse than finding out, but there is at least one thing and that's not finding out. So, as I, again, they are two tools for us to work together, two weapons against our common enemy, and this is a work that God did in this church. I hope that what I've explained and the way I've explained it shows you the potential of these and how that we can work together instead of doing battle with one another, and that you'll join me in the prayer, God, where to now? Because this holds up in the very heavy Bible prophecy, in the thick of a Revelation seminar, as well as just coming to church one morning and just hearing the sermon uh, on, on whatever level you like. They are so clear and they are so powerful and they establish what Satan has done and what God has said. So will you join me now in a prayer? Well, thank you, Father. I've hopefully discharged my duty to you and to these dear people who you've given me as my church family. I love them dearly. And I'm so grateful for them. I'm so grateful that you've shown me these things. And I'm so grateful that I'm not alone in this anymore. That there's a whole room full of people that have had it explained to them. We need to know your will. This is a work that you did. I didn't figure any of this out. You gradually revealed it to me, starting broadly and then getting very specific. And then you opened the doors for me to share it. Thank you for loving us so much that you would send your son and save us and that you would have a relationship with us at all but thank you for giving us these amazing tools these amazing weapons help us to know what you want us to do now and thank you for loving us so much be with us now as we go into this week and, and give us opportunities to show people how much you love them and pray in jesus wonderful and precious name